the text. You can do it on your own. Um, this, this experience, I must say, uh, was more the case, I remember in the early years, in the uh, early 70s when we first started our teacher, uh, a lot of the Westerners like myself who came in were inclined to that first track uh, just because we thought we were, could do it ourselves. We were very independent, self-reliant. Um, many of us were sort of counter-cultural in the sense, and so we didn't have a lot of reverence for authority um, or for the written word, and we were going to get enlightened by our own bootstraps, so to speak. And so the danger with that one is uh, you overestimate your abilities and you get ensnared by your own hubris. Uh, the other side of the more slower one is sometimes uh, you lack confidence, and so you can easily be... Uh, diverted from your course if something comes up and challenges you or it's not pleasant. And the last text part we're reading of Hanshan, I don't know if you can pull up that too, but I'll just read it. Um, it's right before the verse, cultivators of the way feel to, fail to see what's true. You got that section? Yeah, right before that. Uh, so it'd be the previous document. I'll just read it. Uh, here he says, in this more indirect way, one needs only to worry about quitting too soon or literally becoming complacent. Uh, and then he uses this language as avoid dawdling or lingering in the play of light and shadow outside the door. So he says, as you go into your, let's say, deeper or more complex uh, layers of consciousness into the eighth consciousness, um, he compares it to um, phenomena, states can arise both within and without that are very intriguing, uh, but he says basically it's just like a movie. It's light and shadows outside the gate. Don't get stuck. Otherwise, he says, you won't be able to completely, entirely break through the eighth consciousness and uh, be free of this conditioned uh, back and forth. He says, any breakthroughs you have will still be at the borders of consciousness. If you regard them as genuine, you're mistaking a thief for your own child. And then he gives the verse, um, cultivates the way, failing to see what's true. They fail to see what's true because they cling to these shifting consciousness. They don't penetrate past it. And then the third line is, a mistake a pretender for their true self. Sometimes this is called mistaking a thief for your own child. Um, and then for limitless culpas, uh, immense amount of time, uh, they are root bound into this samsaric cycle because they're unable to get past these manifesting states and they take these to be real. So they kind of get caught in the illusory uh, elements of consciousness and don't penetrate. So from there, uh, we, we departed a bit and we went to um, this biographical, autobiographical of the forest monk um, in the parts we've read so far, he describes, in fact, um, because he didn't have a teacher, uh, not because he was arrogant, it's just that um, he didn't have conditions to find a teacher, and uh, he went off by himself into the forest of Thailand, wandering around, and practiced meditation pretty much unguided, and did a really intense meditation experience. He became a monk, and so he just had the requisites of his robes and a bowl, mosquito net, and a few things like that, which is part of that Dutanga wandering practice. He lived in, in caves in the wood areas where there were wild animals and lots of bugs and so forth. It wasn't, um, you know, like sitting on the shores of, you know, Southern California and meditating. This was pretty, and you know, he had been in the jungles of Thailand. No, we're not talking about Disneyland. And... Um, he encountered many states. Now, the external states, he had enough. He was from a rural background, and he was familiar with that area, so he wasn't completely blown away by the harsh physical realities that he was encountering, um, like most of us would be. <laughs> uh, if you just got dropped in a, you know, a Thai forest with nothing but a mosquito net, uh, I think you know the first night you'd be back home. Uh, so, but it was the as he started to concentrate his mind, as he tried to, he knew concentration was trying to hold the mind to a single point of attention and not let it wander. Um, as Han Shan describes, when you do this, a, a, a resistance from the ego, from the accumulated 
uh, identity of the ego then manifest and these states arise. And so if you understand them when they arise, you just see them as not extraordinary at all, nothing phenomenal, uh, just part of the process. And you just remain even. It's called equanimity. You just, no highs, no lows. Whatever comes, you just deal with it. My teachers say, um, whatever is extraordinary, see it as ordinary, and it'll just level out by itself. Don't see anything as extraordinary. Um, so having that instruction helped us a lot, but he didn't have that. And so he describes when these states came, sometimes he would be literally up in the heavens, delighted, um, blissful, and then other times cast down into the hells and very troubled and disturbed. And he was all over the place like on a roller coaster. He used the expression sightseeing um, to describe spiritual sightseeing, what was going on. And after months of this, he realized this was going nowhere. This was just uh, an endless variety show. Uh, and it didn't seem to not only not stop, but it got even more interesting or more wild. But he wasn't really, he knew somehow he really wasn't making progress because he wasn't more settled. He wasn't more clear. He was more agitated, um, either looking for these states to happen or fearing they would come and whatnot. So he, didn't, he knew it wasn't working, but he didn't know what to do and so forth. So the, the word that's used for this in um, cultivation practices is, is a word called discernment, to discern. Any, anybody familiar with that term? What does it mean? Distinguish. Right, it, it means to distinguish between um, usually something that's not obvious. So it requires a little bit of extra clarity or objectivity because you don't have to have discernment when things are really clear. Is the sun out? You don't have to discern whether the sun's out. But it might take a little discerning to say, if it's totally cloudy, is the sun still there? That would require a little more discernment. And sometimes it has to do with moral choices too, where it's not just black and white. But there's, it's a complicated thing, and so you have to have the, going back to the French word, the etymology of this has to do with sifting, sifting and winnowing. Uh, do you, nobody, nobody in Berkeley sifts the winnows, right? <laughs> do you know what it means? Uh, some of you have agricultural backgrounds. What does it mean? You're shaking your head. Yeah. Yeah, wheat from you know, the shaft, that's one way. So one way you do it, you take a basket and you just shake that basket with the seeds in there and gradually uh, either the wind will blow off the, the coverings and the, the kernels will remain or you do it in a sieve and so that the, it's just the right size so the grains will fall through but the other stuff stays. So it's, it's a process of separating the true and the false. That's where the word comes from and so for Spiritual discernment, it has to do with distinguishing or perceiving through a, a not clear situation. Did you want to ask something? I, no, I know you're doing yoga, but the... <laughs> did you have a question? I saw your hand go up. Connie. A little louder. Well... She asked, is, it, is discernment using intuition? Um, not exactly, because discernment implies a number of qualities you have to bring. One is uh, you have to have um, some good theory to draw on, to distinguish. You have to have some principles that you use to distinguish. Uh, you need to have the basket, so to speak. And intuition ultimately is could be called discernment, but it's a trained intuition. It's not just your first response. So often what we call intuition is a kind of uh, unbaked uh, sense of something. But again, discernment means you take that intuition and you then sift and winnow and you look at it from a number of angles. Um, the text would tell me this, my own experience tells me this, my teacher has told me this, and you kind of put all these things together and then you penetrate, you, you, you sift and winnow. So in the text, they talk about the trained intuition 
is your first thought and it's very reliable, but this is something that's cultivated so that there's nothing blocking your intuition. Because sometimes intuition can be hidden desires or fears manifesting and you have to be careful that first response, which you might think is an intuition, turns out to be just a, um, a movement of emotion or something. So it's, it's something trained. If you look at the Confucian text, Confucius said he finally got to it when he was about 70. And then he said, I could follow my first thought, my intuition, without going wrong. But for the previous 50 or some years, he was training and cultivating that. So it's, it's a, it's a, it could be intuition, but only when it's developed. Anyhow, so this is the discernment part. And uh, this passage, now if we go back to Ajahn Mun, uh, let's go to in the early days when I was not able. Can you find that? Keep going down. It's, yeah, there we go. So we're going to pick up here. Um, again, the text is continuing. He says, in the early days when, when he, and this is the narrator of his biography, when he was not able to keep up with his own nimble and overactive mind, so what he's calling here is his untrained mind at the beginning is the use of words it's nimble, meaning very. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jumped over the candlestick, you know that little. So this is, this is like the acrobat, a nimble acrobat. Um, it's also like uh, a monkey. Monkeys are very nimble, so if you try to catch it, it jumps and goes all over the place. So, and overactive, this isn't ADD. I think this is what it is talking about, is just his mind, it's, he's young, uh, he's got a lot of energy, and he's naturally inclined to have a very active mind. So if there's nothing going on, his imagination just goes into high gear. Uh, someone like this can entertain themselves without devices. Um, it often troubled him by pain, uh, by being truant. In other words, he's saying, here I am, I'm meditating, we're all meditating? No, the mind ran off. It was plain hooky. Um, when, for example, he forced it to contemplate the body down to the feet, this was his meditation technique he was using, was contemplating the body, it would flash out of the body and penetrate the ground. <laughs> and when, on the other hand, it was brought back into the body in an instant again, it jumped upwards into the air, flitting back and forth there with pleasure and delight, showing no interest in coming back down. So again, he says, only with a forcible pull of mindfulness could it be made to obey and come back to the body for contemplated purposes? So he was in this struggle uh, with his overactive mind. The state of one point in this, at that stage, came forth deep and strong. So when he could do it, bring it back, his yishin, this single-minded concentration, which is the stopping of shamata vipassana. So it's holding the mind. It's still not insight, but at least it's the first stage of stabilizing uh, the mind. Uh, when he got to that, gave him deep and strong, he's able to keep up with it. He could actually use the single-mindedness to hold the mind from wandering. So in other words, he found the technique that if he came back to his meditation topic and held to it, the mind would as if, say, to follow. Now, of course, they're non-dual. They're one and the same. And so the meditative technique is just a trick to hold the mind from wandering. Um, this was like a person suddenly falling down a precipice, reaching the ground instantly, but the mind remained uh, only for a moment in that profound and unshakable condition. It would then withdraw and enter the next lower stage called uh, upakara samadhi, literally entering the wandering within. So while he would be able to contain it wandering without, then it would start to wander within. So some of you who've been in meditation retreats know what this is like. You're sitting there, you're calm, you're doing the right practices, but the mind has found this immense landscape within to wander in. Memories, dreams, reflections, all sorts of things, and it just goes on and on and on. It's like one of the um, you know, 18th century British novels where the novelist got paid for every word they wrote, so it, you know, these long novels, long and long and long, and yours just goes on, chapter after chapter. You know, your first day, chapter one, your second day, you're back in your childhood, and your next day, you're into your future, uh, you know, when you're married, and you have blah, 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 blah. And so it just runs all over the place. What, what transforms out when you're not looking around? 
Yeah, you're not, you're not chasing external sights, sounds, smells, and taste. And he's not leaving his body now and, and going to these other realms, but now he's wandering within. And then it wandered without control, clumsy, <laughs> this is wonderful, catching glimpses of things here and there in the various planes of consciousness. Okay? Uh, at that time, he was greatly vexed by this behavior characteristic of his mind, which defied any restraint, being quicker and more nimble than the curbing force of his mindfulness. This is a beautiful line. In other words, the harness I have will not hold this horse. And again, I refer you back uh, sometime in the future. I, I will follow up with this because somebody reminded me I haven't yet. The ox prints, you know, the woodcut, the ox woodcut, because that actually uses the image of the mind as this untamed wild bull, and then the person is a little child, and all he has is a little rope to try to, and he can't even see the bull, and when he sees the bull, he can't even get the lasso on him and so forth. So this follows that kind of uh, metaphor um, that he could not curb with the power he had. Since this was his own private internal affair as he had no one to whom he could turn for counsel, again, no Kalyana Mitra, no good and wise mentor, um, it caused him considerable frustration for some time. <laughs> I mean, this is an understatement. If you're sitting there in the jungle by yourself and this is happening, yeah, it would be considerably frustrating. Um, the force of the mindfulness had to be developed and strengthened to counteract the mind that was so fleet of foot. This period of determined struggle against his ultra-dynamic mind was painful and discouraging. I, I, I share this with you because when we begin our practice, whatever we're doing, whether we're bowing, memorizing, reciting, uh, these kinds of feelings will come up of, it's painful, it's hard, I, I'm discouraged, and so forth. So to see that even people are considered great cultivators, and he was considered to be an arhat, um, went through this as well. You're not born, you know, you don't come out, most of us don't come out in full lotus and go, oh, thus it is. You know, there's this struggle you go through to reclaim your natural ground of your mind, and how far you let it go to seed, it can be very discouraging to get back. But we should take uh, sucker from this to realize even great cultivators deal with this. This is not something that, oh, oh I deal with because I don't have, no. Even the sages go through this stage. Um, everything that we can do and imagine with our state of cultivation our mind, every Buddha and Bodhisattva and sage went through it. <laughs> okay? There's nothing that we're going to come up with that hasn't been traversed by those who have gone before. So, chill. <laughs> <laughs> You're in good company. So this period of determined struggle, painful, discouraging, but the wild stallion of his mind, another metaphor, was finally broken. And once brought under control and made obedient, it proved to be of an inestimable advantage. So once trained and subdued, it became a powerful vehicle for insight and understanding. So wonderful was its power, coupled with that of mindfulness and wisdom, that it turned to be a wishing ring. Um, I, I'm guessing what a wishing, wishing ring? You familiar with that? Uh, um, well, let's see. Some people throw coins in a well, in a fountain. Right, and they make a wish. So it's like a coin in a wishing fountain. This is probably a metaphor from his culture that you have a ring and you make a wish on it and then your wishes come true. Chinese have the wish, <coughs> wish fulfilling pearl. There's that expression. Um, anybody know anything else? Oh, we used to, um, when I was growing up, and not a vegetarian, at Thanksgiving we'd eat a turkey, and then there would be the, the, the bone of the turkey, it was, and it was called a wishbone. So it was, it was forked like that, and then uh, we would do, scissor, paper, rock, to see, because there was four kids and there was only one bone with two sides. So one person hold one side, one person hold the other side, right? And then you'd pull on it till it snapped, and whoever got the top point, got the longest one, got their wish. So you'd stand there and you'd say, wait, 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 I'm gonna make my wish, I'm gonna make my wish. And I'd say, my wish is you lose. You know? <laughs> and then, 
No, you make whatever wish you want. You couldn't tell. You'd lose the wish power. And then you'd pull on until snap. And um, I didn't do a clinical study on this. I don't think it's very objective, and it probably didn't work. <laughs> I wished for another brother, and that never happened. I had three sisters, and it just got worse. So, uh, But that's the wishbone, it's called. So everybody has this. It turned out to be unexpected and almost unlimited purpose. Now it's the commentator saying, uh, Fra Ajahn Mun was no, nobly courageous and sagacious, being resourceful in his training methods. Now resourceful in his training methods because he had to be without instruction. He had to be resourceful. He had to figure out his own path both for himself and others. It was difficult for any of his disciples to match this aspect of his character. The writer, from his stay with the Venerable Ajahn and from his experiences gained there, can affirm that the Venerable Ajahn was really unique. Uh, in character, he was very gallant or gallant and correspondingly relentless and unflinching in his mode of practice. His methods for taming the wild stallion of the mind were ingeniously diversified to suit the circumstances. So now he's describing the expedient means that this cultivator used and probably shared with his disciples. So this, this guy's rough hewn, he's raw, but he's the real thing. And again, you see another element that I always bring out is no matter how many texts or teachings you read, some of the most powerful inspiration comes from the living models, the embodied tradition. That's why the living tradition is so important. Um, it's one thing to have the text, but to see someone actually realize it then becomes much more powerful because you can imagine yourself then being able to do it. So he says, according to the circumstances, and then he says, in some occasions threatening, in other occasions soothing with gentle instructions. This matched the mind was itself likewise resourceful and defiant, rebelling against all attempts at curbing it. It is this kind of mind that always makes up a variety of excuses and sinister accounts in order to discourage or distract the aspirant whenever he or she is off guard in for a split second. What he's talking about is this mild, mad mind is not only not trying to distract you, but it actually will, I don't know how to say this, it will have you have thoughts that you, you don't have what it takes. You should get discouraged, you should quit. So it's almost like, uh, a voice, it's not a voice, but it's, it's, it's this ideation within uh, that you self-destruct, you self-discourage yourself in this process. And you start listening to this and you become very dejected. He says, all of this suffering and all of these delays were according to the better Ajahn due to a lack of a competent teacher to offer counsel and helpful hints as what course to follow. And then he, let's, we'll finish this tonight. And he says, however, due to his own imperfections, he was not able to open the Tripitaka case and was therefore not well versed in the academic side of the doctrine. Now, um, you probably don't, what's the Tripitaka case that he wasn't able to open? Well, what's a Tripitaka case? What's a Tripitaka? Let's go backwards. Tripitaka. Pitaka is basket. Try is four. No. Good. <laughs> Try is like tricycle, which would be two. Three. So what is it? Did somebody? Try Pitaka. Right. So these are the three ways of organizing the teachings of the Buddhist tradition, the sutras, uh, either Abhidharma, in some cases Shastra, and then the Vinaya, which are the rules of discipline. So it's, and these are put called three baskets. So the Tripitaka case is the case that the canons put into. <laughs> like behind the altar here, there's a case and the Tripitaka's in there. It's your bookcase, okay? With a glass front door. But, huh? Well, where I'm going with this, he had a dream early on, and in his dream he was riding a wild white horse. Um, but he kept passing by this case of sutra text, and he couldn't get off the horse, and when he did, he couldn't open the case. And so, yeah, this was his early dream, and now he's going back to saying this was a sort of prophetic dream of his condition that he wouldn't in his lifetime be able to access the teachings. 
because he wasn't literate enough to do it, and he didn't have a teacher who could teach him, and so he ended up just doing it on his own in the forest, and it had benefits in that he got great strength in, from his resourcefulness, but it had disadvantages because, it, again, he said he wasted so much time that could have been not wasted if he would had access to the teachings. Thus, he was not equipped with the fourfold, and this is called uh, patisamhida nana. Um, this is just referring to the four eloquences. In other words, the ability to teach in a wide variety of ways. Um, you can explain and summarize the teachings with uh, really good discernment, um, and you can uh, deal with new situations, come up with addressing dharma by principle. You can look at new situations, for example, the Buddha didn't talk about genetic engineering. But if you have this fluency, this discernment, you can take the principles and make a statement on this. It's, um, you can also summarize, uh, summarize complicated details and, and have a really quick memory to trace back uh, sections of text. Um, you, your fluency with words and language in a number of languages, not your own native languages, allows you to appeal to a wider audience. That's the third one. And then the fourth one is the really skillful uh, fang bien or upaya that you can ex skillfully explain the application and adaptation of the principles, and you can use it with tact and wit and humor um, and drawing from other sources. He didn't have that ability because he wasn't well read in these texts. And that, he says, is required of one who's unfailingly resourceful in the means and methods of teaching. So his ability to become a good teacher, both for himself and for others, was limited because he hadn't studied in this way. Um, and therefore, you, and then the expression is the heights and depths of wisdom like those of sky and ocean being thereby able to teach all sentient beings in all the three realms. His accumulation of merit in the past was not enough, so he said, and that was why he was given only a chance to look outside the Tripitaka case and was not able to look at its contents. So his analysis of this was, although he met the Dharma in this rudimentary way and was very sincere, obstacles that he brought from his past kept him from then accessing the text in this present life, and therefore he couldn't study it. It's a kind of an interesting way of looking at why things happen to us, why we're able to pick up one text and we don't read another, why we're able to come to a retreat but some people don't even though they want to. It, it, it's talking about, it's not just willful consciousness, but there's a kind of stream of karma and good roots that either allow you to move in that direction or obstruct you. So it's interesting, and he was just very humble. He said, because I didn't have enough good roots from the past, I was able to see the case but not read it. That's a very, very interesting way of looking at it. This indicated that his ability to teach others would be that of teaching them what to do, but he wouldn't be able to put it into a format of technical language and moreover, give them the tools to discern for themselves. So the problem with that was that uh, his disciples felt really bereft when he left because that was their only source. So this harkens back to another time uh, when the Buddha was said to be leaving. Um, I think it was Ananda came up and asked him, who, sh who should we take as our teacher? And the Buddha knew that they had relied on him in the same way. And then he said, take the Dhamma Vinaya as your teacher. In other words, in the absence of a Kalyana Mitra, or maybe in conjunction with a good and wise advisor, also use the teachings in the Vinaya as your teacher. And that way you'll have, going back to your question, your intuition is trained by a number of sources. And one of the ways to evaluate a teacher is in fact looking at the Dhamma Vinaya. So a teacher may have all kinds of incredible spiritual powers and psychic abilities and even um, mesmerizing skills. But to discern whether the teacher is a good teacher, you ask, does that teacher measure up in his conduct, her conduct, behavior, and so forth, and teachings with the Dharma and the Vinaya? So you have a double standard here. You can use that to judge the teacher. And then the teacher, if it's teacher solid, can, will introduce you to that. So this is one of the things to look for 
when you're going out to, uh, on your own to cultivate, um, is the place or the person you're going to giving you tools whereby you can become self-reliant um, in a solid way by introducing you to the, these teachings and the explanation of these teachings and not simply relying on his or her own charisma or something, uh, which is maybe okay for a stimulant, but it's not sustenance, if, the, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, important. Okay, um, I think that's, that's what we got to. It's, I, that isn't the whole of it. I just chose that section uh, from his biography to illustrate the text that Han Chan was talking about. Um, and then we'll pick the text up next week. Um, maybe I'll tell a story. Uh, uh, about my or my and Hung Shur's, um discernment skills or lack thereof. Uh, so uh, let me let me lead into it this way. Some years ago, longer than I'd like to think, uh, we undertook a bowing pilgrimage together, and it was done outside, along the highway, and in part, uh, it took two and a half some years to finish. In part, it was inspired by um, one of my teacher's teachers, uh, the Venerable Xu Yun. So some of you know him, his name, Empty Cloud. And he was a, um, a really um, quite a extraordinary uh, cultivator. Uh, lived to be about 119, as far as our records tell us, and stayed in China all his life, even after the 1949 uh, change when Buddhism was suppressed, he didn't go, he stayed there. Um, and was brutally um, struggled against. Um, but he, he, remarkable, but one of the things he did was to do one of these pilgrimages, these three steps, one bow pilgrimages, um, motivated to repay, he said, to repay the kindness of his mother who had died giving him birth. So she had died in childbirth. Uh, he survived, but she didn't. And um, this sense of filial reverence, uh, motivated him to do this bowing pilgrimage uh, and very tough uh, because uh, Hung Shur and I, although we met all kinds of weather, uh, we did not meet the, the cold and ice and snow uh, where he was in China, which is a little more challenging. Um, but in the process of that pilgrimage, uh, he was utmost uh, in his sincerity. Uh, he encountered uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva, uh, Manjushri is the Bodhisattva of great wisdom who manifests in many forms. And as some of you know the story, you know how Manjushri Bodhisattva manifest to Shu Yun? How he appeared to him? Like yeah, like a beggar. Um, so he was bowing and he basically got to the point where he lost consciousness because he was so cold and hungry and hadn't had anything. He was just laying in the snow. Next thing he remembers is there's a fire going, he's warming up, and there's some millet being cooked, and there's this beggar cooking this food for him. And uh, he's amazed, and the beggar restores his life. And, you know, and then there's one exchange in there, um, but he doesn't realize who he is. He just thinks someone's helping him, but he's got this extraordinary presence. And so the beggar says to him, he's taking the snow and he's dropping it into the pot, and then it melts into water. And he says, do you have this where you come from? That's one of the questions he asked Xu Yun. And um, Xu Yun goes, oh, no, I'm from the south. It doesn't snow there. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, the reference some of you know is to the Platform Sutra when the Sixth Patriarch says, afflictions are just Bodhi, ice like water. So it was a kind of Zen question for him. Well, you have water there, and this is snow here, but it's a single substance, just in different, you know. But he missed the whole thing. He's like, no, there won't be snow there. Only after the beggar left, he go, wait a minute. <laughs> that, I, I could have, whoa. And uh, so that was, that was one of the things that happened. So both Hung Shur and I were both inspired by his autobiography, which is really a, a, a great read, if you can find it. It's, it's available now. It's out of print, and sometimes it's too expensive. So... If you ever find a cheap copy, get it. It's just, I think it's just called The Autobiography of Shu Yun or Empty Cloud in English. In any event, uh, I remember reading that uh, in the first days after I came to the monastery. I, I don't know how I got a copy. I read it, and that part really, his pilgrimage really struck me. 
And so when Aung Shri made his vow and I volunteered to go with him, it was partly both of us had in the back of our mind uh, the inspiration of Xu Yun. Uh, so we were bowing along, and I think also in the back of our mind was, hmm, wonder if Manjushri is going to, you know, <laughs> come and do something for us. I mean, it was there. The thought was there. <laughs> uh, and so we were quite a ways along, and uh, in the cold part of winter, it was really wet and rainy. We ended up in the Big Sur area. Uh, so we had made a vow that we weren't going to go inside and accept offerings of people's hospitality. We always stayed outside. Uh, we had an old 56 Plymouth that barely ran, and we stripped it down inside, and that's where we slept, sitting up and uh, in, the, in there. We wrapped ourselves in wool blankets and so forth. So um, we're in there, and we're in this Big Sur campground. Um, now, I hope I'm not going to bore you with this story because... <laughs> Okay, so uh, we had a kerosene lamp, an oil lamp, and we lit that, and we would translate and read the Avatamsaka Sutra every night uh, and write it down in our notebook, and that was, that was sort of our guide for the, for the pilgrimage. And in the middle of doing that, all of a sudden there was this, like, knock on the window. And so I opened the door. You know, there's nobody there. It's cold winter campground. So I opened the door, and there's this... Um, disheveled guy standing there. I mean, his pants are all torn and ripped. He's holding his pants up. He's only got a t-shirt on. His hair is all disheveled and knotted, and he smells horribly. Um, and he's got brown and yellow teeth. And he says, hey, you guys got any food or something? And my first response is, well, you know, look at us. We're, we're monks. We, you know, we only had a little food, um, a couple cans of food and stuff, and what people gave us along the way. And we didn't have many clothes. And I said, no, no, we're just, you know, we're wandering monks. We don't have much, sorry. And I close the door, and we go on. And then Kung Shur, is, he had a vow of silence. So he didn't talk, so he wrote this note. And he handed me the note and goes, maybe Manjushri. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, oh, you think? <laughs> and so I think, okay. Uh, so I open the door, hey, hey, come on back. Yeah, yeah. And I said, so, so yeah, we give you a pair of pants and... And this pair of shoes we have, and he says, oh, that, that sweater looks really nice. Yeah, well, here you go in the sweater. And he says, oh, you got any food? I'm really hungry. So we had a little stash, so I dug into the food. I'm going, okay, you know, the bodhisattva doesn't flinch at giving. You know, and I'm giving away. And he said, uh, whoa, that's a nice blanket. We had these wool army blankets, and we only had two uh, because our sleeping bags had been stolen at that point. So we're going, oh, yeah, well, here's our test. Okay, uh, give him a blanket and give him a blanket. And he says, yeah, it's rainy. How about that rain gear? And that was kept us dry during the day because it was rainy. We had some worker, construction workers had given us these yellow rain suits, pretty good, and that would keep us relatively dry. So we gave him a rain. You guys got any whiskey? And they thought, aha, he's testing us on the vinia. <laughs> no, we don't drink. Oh, okay. And okay, well, okay, thanks. And off he goes. And so we're sitting there thinking, hmm, I guess maybe that was the, the beggar Manjushri, just like, whoa. But we weren't quite sure, but, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we're sitting there shivering and doing the rest of this. Pretty soon, headlights hit us from the side, and the, the lights going, the red lights going around, and it's the park ranger. And um, he knocks on the door, and I open it, and... Uh, there's this guy hanging on to all this gear. He's got handcuffs on, and he's got him by the nap and neck, and he says, uh, look, we've been having a lot of thieves and robberies in the campground lately, and, and we think we finally caught the guy that did it. And in fact, he said, I caught him tonight, and he's got all this stuff. Um, and he claims that you guys gave it to him. <laughs> and we're going, yeah, yeah, we gave it. <laughs> he said, you really gave it to him. He didn't steal it from you. No, no. He said, did he coerce you in any way? Did he threaten you? Did he have a knife or something? No, no. We, we freely gave it to him. And he's going, uh, and he looks in the car and he can see, you know, like we have nothing. He says, are you sure you want to give him all this because you guys don't? Oh, no, we're, we're absolutely positive. Really? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, he had nothing to do. He said, and the beggar's going, yeah, yeah, see, I told you. I told you. <laughs> And uh, so off they go, and then we're, I think, okay. 
And then Hunter writes me another note, and he said, we should have bowed to him. <laughs> and I'm going, right, okay. So the next day we go out and we continue on a little colder, a little wetter, and we're sharing one blanket now at night, which is really pretty tough. But we're thinking, boy, we were really sincere, and that was my juice, and we kind of think, well, now, where's the enlightenment? He didn't ask us, do we have that there or whatnot? And then the second day, uh, our teacher drives up, uh, with another monk. He used to come out and visit us on very timely occasions, and this was timely. So he got out, and he would sit on the back of the station wagon, and we would be down on one knee, and he would say, so, what's happening? What's up? And I'm like, oh, you want to tell him, or I'll tell him? Yeah, <laughs> my juicery body top. <laughs> and he says, what? And so I just babbled on about my juicery body top, the beggar came, just like with Shuyun, and he would, he would sometimes sit like this with his eyes closed, and you can tell he's really listening. He just goes, hmm, hmm. And then, you know, in the, in the park ring and everything, but we were really sincere. We didn't, we didn't go back on our gift of Donna and, you know, and so forth. And then we pause, and it was like long pause. We're waiting. And finally he says, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> stupid. Mayo Jerway, no discernment. <laughs> huh? And um, I said, yeah, that wasn't Manjushri. <laughs> he said, and then he quoted a passage from the Avatamsa that says, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas don't always respond. They only respond when there's utmost sincerity. And I said, yeah, but Shriva, we were, we were really sincere. We really, we really wanted it to be Manjushri. He says, no, no, no. Sincerity, it, to be true, means wanting nothing. If you want and are looking for something, you're not really sincere. You understand? Oh, wow. Then I, <laughs> I wasn't to be completely defeated. I was like, well, maybe it was like a lesser bodhisattva. <laughs> and my, the teacher just looked at me, you guys are really hopeless. <laughs> He said, if there was any bodhisattva in this situation, it was probably the park ranger. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, he, and then he quoted his line, everything's a test to see what you will do, mistaking what's before your eyes, you'll have to start anew. And then uh, I thought, oh, wow. We, we lost doubly here. It wasn't Manjushri, and our mind, our attitude was wrong. See, having that in the mind already, that you were going to have some state, was already not being sincere. He says, just single-mindedly bow, and no matter what happens, everything's okay. As soon as you seek something, you'll have troubles. Oh, okay. You think you'll come next week? Maybe if we're sincere. <laughs> so, and then he sings to the other monkey, he said, open the trunk. And he opened the trunk of his, of his old Chevrolet, and he said, go over there, and, and there was some new clothes, a set of clothes and rain gear and some food. <clears throat> and he said, so try to hold on to this. <laughs> and off he rode. <laughs> so I tell you this story uh, to share my own. Even though I had the text, even though I had a good teacher, uh, discernment can often be clouded over by subtle desires, even though you think they're pure. Uh, they can just make you look very foolish. Uh, so I don't usually tell this story because it doesn't look <laughs> make us look good, but I share it with you because it's like uh, indicative of what he's talking about here, that real sincerity means you're really not seeking for anything at all, nothing extraordinary, nothing other usual, and just take it one step at a time and everything will be okay. So... Sincerity means you're not trying... No, you're, you're trying... In a sense, you're trying not to let your mind go into seeking something. In other words, being sincere means you're so immersed in doing it, you don't have any other thoughts. In the Confucian tradition, they define sincerity as having no ulterior motives whatsoever. It doesn't simply mean that what you say on the outside is what you intend inside. It's like, I'm very sincere, I'm very candid. You're a jerk, that's how I feel about you. No, sincerity in the Confucian tradition means you have stripped away any of those impediments that obstruct you of uniting with the Tao, with the selfishness, self-seeking, greed, ambition, anything like that, and even wanting something. So you're just do, being sincere, you're just doing it because that's what needs to be done to be fully human. You're just trying to be the, the most 
full human potential that you can be without any other thought that you're going to get something or receive something. You just do it because it's worth doing. It's actually called intrinsic for its own sake, not instrumental with the hope of getting something. So sincerity is just expressed as this intrinsic, almost artless, genuine doing it just for the sake of doing it and you don't hope for or expect anything. And you really do try, but you're trying to bring your qualities of character and cultivation to such clarity and purity that that is its own reward. And that's all you're trying to do. But you're not, they'd say, add a head on top of a head. Besides trying to do that, then you're trying to also reach the ring, the wish ring. Well, that was an ex. You weren't stupid for what we did. We were stupid in the sense that we were told many times how to do this correctly uh, yeah. and not to seek for anything. Good states come, bad states come, you pay no attention. You just bring your mind back and single-mindedly cultivate and do it for its own. And when you reach that point, um, clarity and insight will happen by itself. There's nothing to seek. You have it all. Your seeking actually obstructs its own manifestation because it's already whole and complete. So we had the principles really clearly. And we have the text every night that reinforced this. Do not seek outside. Everything is whole and complete within. The Buddha is within your own nature. Simply get rid of the obstructions and seeking and wanting and craving and, and all the various forms of lust. And it naturally reappears by itself in the same way that the sun appears when the clouds are gone. But seeking brings in a cloud cover. And so it actually obstructs. So your, your trying is to remove the clouds. But what he was saying was stupid was on the top of all that good instruction and whatnot, we still did not recognize that state. We still did not recognize that we had turned this ne'er-do-well into a bodhisattva because of our own fantasies in our own minds, and so we did not see things clearly. Whereas in that situation, the only one who did was the park ranger. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's stupid in the cultivated sense is what he's talking about. Right? It, it's sort of like, I told you how to run the bases, and now you're going from third base to second again. No, no, first base, second base, third base, you know, that kind of thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't sort of condemning us, it's just calling us out on, you know, sort of like, wake up. <laughs> it wasn't Manjushri. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, those are two different questions. One question is, how do you help people in need? And you help them according to your share. If you put your family in need because you've helped somebody else in need, you haven't done a good thing here. You've just switched it. So could we have given him something? Certainly. Some of the food and stuff like that. But to give away stuff that endangered us was really stupid, even in an ordinary situation, not the, the mystical but the mistake wasn't that. He would have never faulted us for right. But what he's faulting us for is, is turning this into some Manjushri fantasy. And then we would completely, we not only did not give properly, but we misinterpreted on top of that. And if he hadn't corrected us, you know, we could have run into 20 Manjushris in the trip and we would have got there naked or dead. <laughs> Right, and it wasn't, even a, it, was, it wasn't even a selfless act in the sense that it wasn't middle way. You know, middle way means you do things according to your abilities. If you have the ability to give generously, then do that. 
But if you don't, you need to stay in your own middle way. So those that have a lot should give more, those that have less, doesn't mean you don't give, but you give proportionally. And then the sutras are very clear, you don't have to give things. Sometimes you give strength, you give encouragement, you give support. And sometimes that's more valuable than material things. So you give according to your abilities. But sometimes all you can give in that situation is a word of encouragement and something minor. Don't despair, things will get better. You know, here's something to help you out. Why don't you talk to the park rangers, you know, or go to the local, you know, you know that's a kind of giving too. But to think that it's just giving away material things till you're bankrupt yourself is really, again, Right. Well, the next step would have been, well, we should be able, to, we should give something at least. But we went from, now nah, we're, we're wandering monks, we don't have anything to, oh my God, it's Manjushi, take the car. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you want some blood? <laughs> it's like, I mean, the, Well, let me, okay, that's a very good example. And I'll give you an example. Of, I learned from a Christian monk, a friend of mine, when I was back uh, doing research, I was at a university and I, I didn't, as a monk, I had no place to stay, but in this uh, little monastery, this Christian monastery, these monks put me up and we became really good friends. Um, and I, I saw him once, some beggar came to the door and he did this exchange and whatnot. And I said, well, what did you do there? He said, well, we're in an area, it's, it's a lot of down and out people here. Um, I said, well, what did you give him? He said, well, I used to just go in and give money and stuff from the pantry and whatnot. And they, then he said, you know, the next day or something, I'd see that very same person coming out of the wine store with a brown bag and just using that money to buy wine. And he said, so my first inclination was not to do that anymore. But then he said, no, I didn't want to do that. So what he did, he went around to all of the local motels, and he said, I'm brother so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, if you will join us with this, we will pay for you know two nights of rooming for someone we send to you. We'll pay for half of it if you'll cover the other half, because these were also Christians. And if you give me your card, I'll sign my name, and if somebody comes, you'll know that I've sent them, and... There's no charge. We'll pay for the half, you pay for the other half. Then he did the same thing for the grocery stores. He, he got some cards like that and said, if you go to so-and-so grocery store, show them this card, they'll give you some food. So he didn't stop giving, but he used discernment, and it wasn't giving them cold cash. So if they really needed food or lodging or something like that, and he did it also for the, uh, the local Goodwill store for clothing. So he was able to respond and make sure that it went but not at the same time just throw a cash. So that would be some discernment and skill and means, what was going on there. That was a really good lesson. I didn't tell him about when we gave, because <laughs> he doesn't know who Manjushri is. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you found that useful or interesting, or at the very least humorous. Uh, so any announcements? Anything coming up people need to know? <coughs> this uh, next Thursday? At what time? Okay, we'll do the transference in English.
with light. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May their minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world <coughs> into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate. <coughs>